Well, hello everyone and welcome to a policy forum with the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm Kent Lastman and today we have a powerful conversation planned about something that makes the modern world possible, plastics. Plastics are poorly understood and currently under attack. We're going to do something about the former in order, I hope, to change the latter. Our program today is both live and being recorded. It will be available on CEI's website and YouTube. And I encourage you to both share the presentation as well as to give us feedback. There'll be an opportunity at the end of the hour that takes about 90 seconds. The number of RSVPs for the live stream has been very high. And during the second half of the program, I'll do my best to involve you in the conversation. To that end, I encourage you to use the Q&A function that you find at the bottom of your screen or send an email to events at cei.org. Before we dive into a discussion of policy ideas that have been percolating here in Washington, I wanna make sure that we get a solid grounding in plastics, what they do, the risks they present, and some of the relevant information about their life cycle. I'm joined today by two experts. First, we'll hear from Dr. Chris Darmit, the scientist behind the Plastics Paradox, Facts for a Brighter Future, as well as the website, plasticsparadox.com. Just real quick, let me show you the book cover so that you can make sure to find it when you go to buy it after the program. Afterwards, I'm going to turn to my colleague, Dr. Angela Logomassini, who's a senior fellow here at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Throughout the autumn, Angela has been publishing a series of papers on plastics, the environment, and human welfare. So Chris, welcome to CEI. I don't wanna stand on ceremony and, and have a lot of preamble. There's just too much material to cover. If we could, let's just get started with the basics. You're a polymer scientist. You've published this comprehensive book and it's written for a lay audience. What got you into this education work? Well, uh, one day I was sitting right here in this chair and my two daughters came home from school, the local elementary school, and they told me what they learned that day. And to my horror, I discovered that they'd been taught clear lies by their teachers. And so uh, that made me angry. And because I'm paying an insane amount of property tax to have a good education for my kids, not to have them taught lies at school. So first I was angry and initially at the teachers. And then I realized these teachers are just people like you and I, they get their information from the media, from uh, you know online headlines and so forth from LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever. And uh, they're not really to blame. And so I looked for a credible source um, so that I could set the record straight. And I didn't really find anything. I looked for books and um, I didn't find any which were factual. I didn't find any which were backed by science. And so I went on a little quest to find some science. and. The trouble is that um, once you start down this rabbit hole, there's no end to it. So um, I knew, for example, that plastics do not take hundreds of years to degrade. A plastic bag takes less than one year to fall to pieces outdoors. That's what scientists have found, right? But so if you tell somebody that, they'll say, okay, well, I accept that. But what about the litter? What about the waste? What about the microplastics? What about the oceans? And it goes on and on and on. And because this is a puzzle, you need to have all of those pieces to see the answer, right? That's the problem. I'm a professional problem solver as a scientist. I solve tough problems. And the first thing you learn when you're solving tough problems is to really understand the problem. And unless you put in the work to do that, you'll never really find the solution. And so that's what I see now, that um, I see a lot of expert panels with people who are not at all experts. They have no clue. Many of them have never read a single scientific article. Um, and even if they are an expert in one area, let's say microplastics, they're completely oblivious to the science in the other areas. And so in order to do, to do a good job um, and to really tell a story, to have the whole picture, I started down this rabbit hole of reading hundreds initially and then thousands of scientific articles to learn about all of these topics. Because if you want to just defend a position, let's say you've, you, this is how people act, right? They start off with one opinion, they go and find two articles that support it and then they give up. But a professional scientist doesn't do it that way. If you go in and look for a life cycle analysis, let's say of bags, plastic bags, um, you go and look and find everyone that's ever been published, right? To make sure you're not just grabbing a skewed one. You find everything you can, read it, and then come to a conclusion only after you've seen the evidence. And that's a lot more work than just making stuff up and, um, and tweeting things online. And so it's, um, it's been a giant waste of my time in some respects, but I feel kind of proud to have brought um, some information to the subject. And when you say uh, 
it's, it's, this has been a, a passion project. So you say you've, you've brought some information to the subject. You've also brought some attention to it. I, mm -hmm. I don't know that we'll do a lot of um, outright promotion, but I think it's worth drawing people's attention to the notion. Um, there's been a lot of interest in your website. You've had this book uh, published in multiple languages, 60 Minutes, the BBC. People are covering this work. It seems to be that there's a demand for it as well. Yeah, there is a demand, but I want to make a distinction here because the book is for free, right? You can go to my website. Everything on the website is free. There's, n there's not even a place where you can sign up, right? I have no mailing lists and uh, the book is available in multiple languages as a PDF for free because, um, and it's important that the work is done for free because too many too much of the information we get is from vested interests, right? There's uh, NGOs trying to get your donations out of your pocket. There's a uh, government, people who have their own uh, agenda sometimes. There's uh, companies trying to sell you all kinds of green products, which turn out not to be green when you check them. So that was important to me to give away the book uh, because otherwise people assume, hey, this guy's just saying this stuff for money. And it's quite the contrary. I've lost a, at least a thousand hours of my own time and many thousands of dollars to publish the book and to put in all of this work. So um, this is a massive uh, waste of my time and a waste of my money from, uh, a, from a business point of view, but from a, maybe from a humanitarian point of view, it might be worthwhile, we'll find out. Angela, let me turn to you and, and get you involved in this conversation. Uh, a lot of your work has kind of turned on its head the conventional wisdom, uh, at least the conventional wisdom such as it passes here in Washington, DC about chemicals, risk, uh, and in the last several months, some extensive work that you've done on plastics. Uh, what, what sort of reactions do you have to what Chris led off with and his book at, in general? Angela, I think we have you on mute. Sorry about like, that. <laughs> that's all right, it's life of Zoom. Sure, so I've been working on these issues plastics issues, but also solid waste in general for about 30 years. Um, and Chris's book is perhaps the best, and not perhaps, I, I would say it's the best and most comprehensive work I've seen on plastics. And I think it has tremendous, it's tremendously important today uh, because people don't understand the value that plastics bring to society. And there's a lot of effort um, to get rid of them. Um, and the end result of that through bans and regulations that policymakers are looking at is going to be a net negative impact on um, the environment and wildlife in a lot of ways that you wouldn't expect. And Chris's book does a tremendous job. He goes through all the life cycle, and as life cycle assessments that have been done on plastics over decades. And overwhelmingly, they show that plastics actually reduce the amount of water we use, they reduce the amount of energy we use, even reduce pollution and the amount of landfill space we need. You know, so he, it really underscores why we should be wary of what policymakers are doing right now, because there are going to be a lot of negative impacts. Um, of course, we want to make sure that we're addressing real problems, and real problems include litter, particularly litter in the ocean and litter that impacts wildlife. Chris has a lot of great information on that too, also sort of clarifying what the impact is, because there's been a lot of misinformation about that as well. So by better defining the problem, I think we're in a better position to find answers thanks to his great work. Um, but you know, right now there's legislation in Congress that would set up this extensive, what's called extender, extended producer responsibility programs. Programs that would be very complicated, very bureaucratic, very top down, um, would really mess with our entire solid waste management system. I think would create a lot of problems and basically could put the plastics industry out of business because they, they set a lot of impossible standards. Um, there's also provisions to stop the permitting of plastics facilities or new plastics facilities and even plastics recycling facilities. And you know, a lot of people want to recycle, they think it's the answer. And it's been really challenging in the past. And there are new technologies that are emerging that could make plastics recycling much more viable. Um, and because they convert the plastics back into chemicals to make virgin plastics, a lot of the environmentalists and others are against these types of recycling. And so they actually want to ban that in these bills, which is ridiculous. It's like the option, the, the final opportunity for us to do something really good in terms of plastics recycling, and they don't want it. They just want to get rid of plastics. Maybe they don't like them because they're petroleum-based. 
Um, but in the end, uh, they're going to do a lot more harm than good. And Chris's book is invaluable for policymakers and anybody else you know, who wants to get more information on this to understand that there are impacts of these policies that certainly would be worse than the plastics themselves. So we should be looking for solutions on the waste management side, not trying to eliminate a valuable product. I, I want to pick up on a term just before we get too deep on this, and we will be coming back to the policy implications. I want to pick up on a term that each of you have used. And um, uh, what makes me think of it is actually the policy environment. Uh, so you've each said uh, the life cycle or life cycle analysis. Uh, too often, I think lawmakers, um, they legislate from the front page. They see a story, there's a headline, there's something that catches the attention of, of a constituent back home. And lo and behold, a couple hours later, they have uh, an idea for a new law. Uh, life cycle analysis, the scientific process of looking at something more than just in the immediate time frame, uh, is a counter to that. Can you explain the role that life cycle analysis has and how, how the private industry analyzes their products and the things that they create to understand impact? I think Chris can start with that and then I'll follow up. Sure. So um, people like to claim things are green, but then you ask them, what does it mean, right? We see greenwashing, we see claims which are, which are unsubstantiated. So when somebody asks me, what do you mean by green? I say, the thing which causes the least harm, according to life cycle analysis. And the reason I say that is that there's only one accepted way to know what is green, and that is a life cycle analysis, right? That's where you add up all of the fossil fuel that you use to make a product, all of the pollution created, all the water you used, all the energy you, you used, all the transportation, all the packaging, even the litter at the end of it can be included in it, and the waste disposal or the recycling, the whole thing, right from beginning to end, is included. And so you do that, which is really arduous. And years ago, it was very expensive. And now there are softwares for doing it where people agree, you know, there are tables of data have been accumulated and there are standard methods, right? So A, it's standardized and it's been developed over decades and B, it's peer reviewed. So you can't just pull a fast one and make up something that looks, you know, favorable for your product. There is some uh, scrutiny on these things. Um, having said that, so it's the only way to know what's green. If you're claiming something's green and you don't have any life cycle data, you don't have a case to make. There's... Um, and then some people will say, well, it's not perfect, so we shouldn't rely on life cycle analysis. And, I, and then I say to them, well, if you want to throw away the only worldwide accepted tool used by NGOs, it's used by governments, used by companies, if you want to throw out the window, the only tool we have, what are you going to do? Toss a coin to decide what's green? I mean, that's a preposterous idea to say that because something's not perfect, we should throw it out. Um, it's been developed, as I said, over decades. Everyone accepts it. And the way that I try to get around bias in a life cycle analysis is I make sure I download everyone I can find. So, and it comes to bags, for example, um, you just type in LCA bag, right? Life cycle analysis bag into Google. And I found 26, that's the, that's the largest collection in the world. And every single one ever done in any country in the world proves that plastic bags are greenest. They cause the least harm. Every material causes some harm, but if we're, if we're smart adults, we would pick the material. Either we go and live in caves and we say, right, we don't want to cause any harm. We're going to go back to caves and we don't have anything. Or we say, okay, we're going to continue with our nice cozy lifestyle that we love so much. And we'll pick the materials and the products that cause the least harm. And in the case of bags, every study ever done in the history of mankind proves that plastic bags are greenest, meaning less CO2, less fossil fuel, less water, and less pollution and so on. And so it, it boggles my mind that that politicians are banning and taxing the proven greenest solution. And it also boggles my mind that companies like Greenpeace, who have, according to Wikipedia, have $400 million, it's never occurred to them in the last 30 years to type life cycle analysis plastic bag into Google and download a PDF. I mean, why, why are companies who are claiming to defend the environment so lazy that they can take $400 million of our money and not be bothered to type in LCA bag into Google? And it's not just Greenpeace, it's World Wildlife Fund and it's other organizations who are claiming to be interested in the environment and just either, either they're corrupt or they're negligent or they're wildly idiotic that they can't be bothered to even spend a few moments to check the facts as my, my 10 year old kids could do it. They could type in LCA bag or LCA straw, these different things to see what really makes sense for the environment. Why are we making decisions when the data is there and it's free? So I, I... One of the things I hear from you, 
which makes uh, perfect intuitive sense. It, I mean, it applies in the rest of my life is that there's no perfect product. There's no perfect material to be chosen. And uh, we run the risk of you two agreeing for the entire hour. So I'm gonna see if I can stir things up here and Angela ask you, I, I think I heard something that uh, you might take issue with that Chris was talking about. Uh, there is no perfect material. So if we were to go live in caves like uh, Stone Age times, uh, we still would be doing choosing materials, right? And you've done a lot of research and writing about the alternatives to plastic and the effect on animal welfare and conservation and biodiversity. Could you talk a little bit about the alternatives to these these modern products that we're okay. we're using? I, actually, I would like to first address a little bit on the life cycle thing. Um, there is something I slightly disagree with, Chris. On I, I don't think it's the only way. I think the life cycle analysis basically tracks what we as economic minded people talk about a lot, which is the market process and the price signals. The reason plastics are cheaper is because plastics use more resources, less resources to make. They're very inexpensive. And that price signal is a big part of what drives efficiencies in the marketplace. So the life cycle is a scientific method of showing the market process. That's how I've always looked at it. Um, if people paid a lot more attention to price signals, you know, we would do much better. For instance, when there's a water problem, the prices need to go up if there's scarcity. Um, just similarly with plastics, if it's cheaper to make a plastic bag, you're using less energy, less water. Um, you know, there has to be some cost assigned to the externalities of pollution. Um, you're going to have a lower price. And so with plastics, a lot of the energy savings and, and such are upfront. So then they, when you get to the disposal side, actually they're as easy to dispose of in the landfill, um, they're more difficult to recycle. So now we need, if we want to recycle them, we got to come up with a way to, to, to work on that, but it needs to be driven by prices. So that's my, my sermon on um, life cycle analysis. In terms of the other things, um, and I know Chris points out a lot of this in his book as well. In the past, you know, we had to find something that would serve the purposes of plastic. And in the past, it was things like animal horns and tortish, tort turtle shells. And without having a plastic alternative, the demand on those things would continue to go up and we would have real problems and maybe some extinctions of wild animals if we can't farm them enough. Um, farming them is another solution, but even things like textiles, 60% of our textiles come from plastics, believe it or not, or totally based products. If we had to farm all the cotton and all the silkworms and, you know, we would have to use every piece of planet Earth. So there are a lot of different things in addition to life cycle analysis, as Ken points out, that have environmental uh, savings when you go from plastics, from natural things or so-called renewable things to plastics. Renewable actually does have an environmental impact. You know, nothing is impact free as Chris. That's right. Out. Well, you made a great point. And let me expand on that. So in my studies, I wasn't just reading about plastics. I've expanded out and I'm comparing them to other materials. And I found an absolutely spectacular book, which is referenced on some of my slides. And it shows the impact of every material um, in terms of CO2 and so forth and energy used. And what you find is that the three most catastrophic materials for the environment are platinum, palladium and gold. Right. So what do we know? We know that they are insanely bad for the environment, meaning the amount of waste created, I think it's 30 tons of waste per third of an ounce of gold. And that's, that includes cyanide and poison and huge amounts of energy and water used. It's just awful, right? But what else do we know about platinum and palladium and gold? We know that they're incredibly expensive and we know, never throw them away, right? So again, we, we come back to what you said, there is a relationship between price and life cycle analysis because the life cycle analysis includes all the waste and all the pollution and all the energy used and all the water used. Many of the same components are encapsulated in the price. So we find that these three horrific materials are A, terrible for the environment, and B, really, really expensive, which means that they're never thrown away and they're always recycled. What materials are on the other end of that scale? On the other end of the scale, we have things like polyethylene, which are proven to be absolutely minimum in impact. In many cases, they're the absolutely greenest option and they're the cheapest option too. And because they're so very, very cheap, we do throw them away and we don't recycle them. So we have a very strange scale here that things which are horrendous for the environment, we look after, we don't throw them away and we recycle them. And things on the other end of the scale, 
we have no problem throwing them on the ground. So, um, and we know that for a fact, right? So if you take a plastic banknote of which there's 8 billion a year printed, that's one for every person in the world. I've never seen one on the ground. I've never seen one in the ocean. I've never seen one on the beach because it's a piece of plastic. It's very easily lost. There's 8 billion a year printed. And I've never seen one as litter because it has a value. So you know, this there's, is an there's a very famous economics joke about the dollar on the sidewalk, but I will, yeah, I will resist self, telling it now. The, the self-cleaning dollar, yeah, it's self, it's a, it's a self-unlittering. So right. um, this is a great point that you bring up, and then you brought up another point. So, so that's the problem with plastics recycling. Not that people don't want to do it, but plastic is so cheap you can't make money recycling it. That's the issue. Not that nobody wants to do it. And so now we have people saying, right, let's let's go to metal and glass because they happen to be recycled at a higher rate right now. Let's go to those. But we know for a fact that they are horrendous for the environment compared to the plastic, right? So what you're doing is you're moving up that scale. You're moving away from the greenest solution to things which take huge amounts of energy and generate huge amounts of CO2 and saying, hey, hey, let's use that because it happens to be recycled. It happens to be recycled because you, you spent so much energy making it, right? And it has a value at the end of the life because of that. So, so it's totally backwards thinking. You're saying, let's take a terrible material for the environment and reuse it again and again, reburning all that energy and all that fossil fuel and re recreating all of that CO2 every time you recycle it and have to eat it up instead of going to the greenest material, which is often plastic or wood, and increasing the recycling rate. So this is completely backward thinking. So and, I, and I just want to put a, a concrete example on this for people so that they can get their arms around the, the uh, trade-offs that you've just articulated. Uh, we look at something like um, the Coca-Cola bottle, right? Uh, glass on one end is very heavy, which means it has very large inputs of energy for transportation, moving it around to the different stores and from the store to your home, uh, as well as the processing to create the glass. Uh, aluminum requires tremendous amounts of electricity to manufacture, as well as the tin that has to be dug up out of the earth as a raw material before you get the finished product of aluminum. And in the middle, we find plastic bottles. And lo and behold, the Coca-Cola company around the world sells their product in plastic bottles. It, did I capture that correctly? Because I want to. I think you have a really important point there about alternatives, and I want to make sure people have something to grasp onto to understand it. Yeah, the numbers are known, and every study ever that I've seen shows that plastic um, bottles are greener than glass or aluminium cans, um, and that's just a fact. Um, so it will be a really bad idea to move away from the proven greenest solution. And we should encourage more recycling, but and we have to find ways of making that work. But the answer is definitely not to move to a material that uses four times more CO2 and four times more fossil fuel and so forth to make and generates far more waste. That would be an idiotic solution. Uh, and as I said, I'm a professional problem solver, right? So I, I look for facts and then I try to come up with logical solutions based on facts. And I'm very careful never to defend the plastics industry because I actually don't care if people buy plastics. I don't care if they hate plastics. I just care that they make sensible decisions based on things that are actually true. Angela, let's let's pick up on that last point for a moment, uh, making sensible decisions about things that are actually true. Why is it that um, Chris labels uh, very, very early in his book, he labels things uh, lies that we're told about plastics and about science? Uh, why is it these myths persist? Why do people keep believing things that are not true and therefore direct, you know, it points them in the direction of making decisions that are not sensible? It's not an easy question. Um, I think though, there's certainly an organized movement of people who don't like plastics because they are the base, they are petroleum based products. And it, it loops into the whole sort of anti oil and gas kind of uh, concept. And a lot of these groups push out a lot of bad information. There's just a ton of bad information online. If you Google you don't come up with Chris's study first and foremost, you come up with a lot of fear mongering. So people are confused. So I think that's why the average person makes bad decisions is because, or is inclined towards supporting maybe some bad decisions for policymakers is because, you know, it, it just, that's what they hear. The other thing is they might see plastics, um, you know, hang on the ground or whatever. Um, my solution to that is to pick them up and to have anti-litter campaigns and things of that nature, but they, they feel bad about it and they want to do something. You know, images of turtles with, and I'll ask Crystal to s discuss this a little bit, with turtles up their noses and uh, videos where they, they pull this alleged 
straw out of a turtle's nose and it went viral. You know, nobody wants that. Everybody wants to know that the oceans are clean and our wildlife has a safe place to live. And so they've gotten a lot of misinformation and so they're just gonna sort of go with it. Chris, maybe you can talk a little bit about what you learned about some of those kind of claims about the impacts on wildlife. Yeah, that, this is great to have a discussion partner because you're bringing up some great points. So one thing I'd like to say is, um, well, when it comes to the turtle, I, a friend of mine actually wrote to the people who had that video, right? Because nowhere in the science, there's no, there's no real peer reviewed scientific paper about that, right? So there's no real scientific evidence that it ever happened. And that made me worried. There is a document online describing finding this thing, it's 15 centimeters long and nowhere in any of the research did they analyze it to see if it was plastic, right? So you've got an object with zero evidence it was ever plastic. So my friend, uh, it's actually the lady, Sybil, who translated the English version of the book into the Portuguese version, which will be out soon. So she wrote to these people and said, was it a plastic straw? What evidence do you have? And they said, though, we never analyzed it to see if it was plastic. And we're not actually sure it's a straw either. It could have been something else. It might have been insulation to a wire or any other number of things. So you can see how powerful an image is, right? These days, these memes come out. You see one picture of an object in a turtle's nose and you make it into a you know, a thing and it goes around the world, it goes viral, as you said, but it's just fiction, right? The whole thing is based on pure fiction. Another example is this book. This book is the first one I can find ever to claim that plastics took hundreds of years to degrade. And the problem is when you read that, I've got a marker in here where the woman wrote plastics take hundreds of years to degrade, but she doesn't cite any science. And the reason for that is that there is not a single scientific publication in the history of the world that says plastics take hundreds of years to degrade because plastics haven't been around for hundreds of years for one thing. Uh, and when we do do the experiments, we find out that that's just not true. P regular people don't realize the plastic industry spends over $2 billion a year on stabilizers because plastics are so unstable that they'll fall to pieces without putting additives in them. So the layperson sees this piece of plastic and thinks it's stable and it actually isn't. So that's a complete misunderstanding. So um, yeah, people are making crazy decisions. And when it comes down to um, oil, that's a, that's a great point. People say to me, Oh yeah, the, fossil, the, um, the oil industry is pushing plastics because that's how they want to save themselves, right? I've seen that online. And that just doesn't make sense because when you run the numbers, plastics actually create a net reduction in the amount of oil. And how can that be, right? People say you use oil to make plastics, therefore plastics must be bad, you know, and, and mean more fossil fuel consumption. And that's not the case because plastics make our cars so much lighter and our, and our trains and our airplanes, that we end up saving far more oil than was used to make the plastic. And that's a calculation that uh, has been done. It's been checked by a lot of scientists and it's rock solid. So the net effect of plastics is to reduce oil consumption and to reduce CO2 emissions. So if the oil companies really wanted to sell more oil, they would try to shut down the plastics industry because it's a threat to them. And people are totally unaware of this. Another, another thing that makes no sense is when they ban plastic. So I had somebody say to me, well, you're, in, you're against plastic bag bans because uh, you know, you're in the plastics industry. And that's, well, it, A, it's not true because I don't make or sell or market plastics. I'm a scientist. But B, um, I've had multiple companies contact me and say that when there's a plastic bag ban, they end up selling more plastic because instead of taking this very, very thin grocery bag and reusing as a trash bag, they go out and buy trash bags, which are way, way thicker. So plastic sales go up about bag sales. The actual amount of plastic use goes up about 40% when there's a plastic bag ban. So again, if the industry or I were against bag, you know, were for plastics, we would be fighting for plastic bag bans. We'd be like, hallelujah, bring it on. We'll sell more plastic. But that's not where my motivation comes from. So whenever you look into the details of these things, the reasons that people, you, you mentioned many reasons people can be against plastics, right? A, they harm turtles. There's no proof of that. I've got the mortality studies for turtles. And if you don't believe me, go to Google and type in turtle mortality study, and you will find the studies to show you what kills turtles and plastics are not even mentioned. Do the same thing for whales, whale mortality study, three words in Google, no bias, see what you find, or just download them, you know, the ones that I cite. Either way, you'll find the same ones I did, right? And do the same for birds, bird mortality study. In the case of birds, all of them, not one mention of plastics anywhere or bag. Right. So we're being told that straws are killing people, bags are killing people, plastics are killing these, these, these uh, animals, sorry. And uh, there's just no evidence for it. It's absolutely fiction. So um, if you if you care about any of those things or oil or if you care about litter or care about waste, it doesn't make any sense to uh, to victimize plastics. And just one one really key number, which shocked me when I found it. Plastics represent 0.4 percent of all the materials we use and all the waste we create. 
And that's on a weight basis, right? So people will always say to me, what is it on a volume basis? It must be higher. And the answer is yes, it's 0.8% on a volume basis. So plastics are less than 1% of all the materials we use and all the waste we create. So even if you had your wish, right? Let's say you're ardently against plastics and you wanted them gone and they were gone tomorrow, you'd have no car and no cell phone and no computer to complain you know, to the plastics industry on. You'd be living in a cave, you'd have no electricity to your place because every wire is coated in electricity. So let's forget about all of that. It would be horrendous. And these people who claim to be against plastics would, wouldn't want any of that. But you would have eliminated less than 1% of all the materials and waste. And ironically, you would have dramatically increased harm to the environment and you would have dramatically increased waste because on average, it takes three or four pounds of other material to replace one pound of plastic. And if you don't believe me, go to your own kitchen Weigh a Kroger plastic bag, six grams. The paper bag, 60 grams, right? It's 10 times more waste. Weigh a paper straw, two grams. Weigh a plastic straw, one gram, twice as much waste. These are not things that I'm just coming up with, right? They're things that you can check in your own kitchen. Um, weigh a paper cup and a plastic cup. Whichever one weighs least is probably greener. So these people who are against plastics are doing it based, are actually causing harm. They feel good about themselves, but they're actually not good people because they're just believing whatever they hear on the internet, acting on that, and they've been too lazy to even look at the facts. Uh, I want to get into a, what, what I think is probably a pretty big topic, but before I introduce and, and invite you to talk about microplastics, uh, I want to bring in some of the questions uh, from our audience and just see if we can get uh, what, what they say now in punditry is the quick take, get, get you each to react to some of these topics. Uh, first and foremost, I want to ask about there is uh, the term waste, uh, Chris, you just used a couple times. And when we're talking, when you were using the example of automobiles, uh, petroleum products are refined, they're turned into fuel for uh, different machinery, including automobiles. Uh, my understanding, and I, and I hope to get the record straight here during our conversation, my understanding is that the byproducts of that process, the process of creating fuels would otherwise be waste. And yet that is what is taken and turned into the core components of making plastics, the polymers and the other, uh, uh, other things that flow downstream. So it, is it the case that we would have large volumes of uh, otherwise waste that now we're make, putting into productive use in the creation of plastics? Is that how the manufacturing process works? I have never looked into that. It does sound like it might have some credibility to it, but because I'm a scientist and I haven't looked into it, I really can't comment. Um, I don't know if Angela's ever looked at it that way, but uh, I'm not somebody who is here to defend a point. If I'm a scientist, if I have data to share, I'll share it. And if I don't have any, then I'll have to reserve my opinion until I've checked into the facts. It's my understanding that um, but yeah, plastics are produced from the chemicals that otherwise would be, you know, could become waste products, you know, through petroleum refining or uh, natural gas processing. Uh, so it's a great use of resources. The way I look at it, throughout history, we were sourcing these things from nature, right? Cellulose from a tree to try to make it when they discovered they could take these chemicals and mix them together, it's like kind of a miracle. They, they were producing products out of almost nothing. So we didn't have to go to rubber plantations overseas to get the rubber and process it and have it shipped all the way across the, you know, the, the, the oceans. We actually could take these byproducts and make real products. So that's another environmental benefit. It, it's a very efficient way of producing something from a product that may not be useful. I mean, granted, they may find some uses for them, but plastics is a huge use. Um, and it adds a tremendous amount of value from something that otherwise might, you know, not have as many uses and might become a waste product. So some people describe it as, as an industrial recycling. Um, I'm not a scientist either, but that's what I read. Um, and it gets down to, you know, just the, the basics of, you know, chemistry. So I, I think Chris actually does know more than I do on this, but <laughs> that's what so I learned going through this Rick, process. Rick, Rick asks, after making a comment about uh, life cycle analysis that was very common and came up in the field in the 1990s, a topic that was not well researched and has he has not seen evidence on is the psychology 
of littering. Uh, Chris, you you cover hundreds of uh, scientific journal articles. You reference them; they're available on the website and cited in the book. Is there research on the psychology of littering? Why people litter? Why they don't litter? Yes, there is some studies on. Uh, there are studies on that. I just got some new information uh, recently. Um, so what I can say about littering is that. Um, so they've done studies for enormous studies. I'm talking hundreds of thousands of littering events, if not millions, I can't remember, but definitely hundreds of thousands of littering events in multiple locations. And they watch people littering. They literally watch them to see if they do it by accident, if it's, is it on purpose? And what they find out is a lot of litter is dropped on purpose. About 80% of litter is dropped intentionally. Um, even if there's a trash can nearby. So they know that people are dropping litter and then they study to see how closely can you put it? Because people will say, well, there's no trash can, right? So we need to, we need to, these people are not doing it on purpose. It's not a person problem. They're blaming these poor people who would love to put it in a trash can if there was only a trash can. So they did studies on that too. They put these trash cans closer and closer together until the minimum amount of littering was found when the trash cans were 20 feet apart, right? You can put them closer and closer, but it doesn't make any difference. The minimum litter occurs when trash cans are 20 feet apart, which is eight steps right? And people were still intentionally dropping litter, significant amounts, even when there was a trash can every eight steps. So that tells you something about litter and the cause of it, right? You can't blame that on trash cans or litter collection or infrastructure or the government or anything else or the, or the manufacturer or the material. You can only blame it on the people. But the last thing people want to do is blame themselves, right? They'll never go and look in the mirror and blame themselves. So they'll always come up with a, you know, a scapegoat or someone else. Can, can I say something on that? Uh, absolutely. Uh, my understanding, though, is that that infrastructure is the biggest issue. That litter that's going into the ocean is coming from places where they don't have proper infrastructure overseas, and is flowing in the rivers and flowing into the ocean. It's not the exact um, amounts that people have estimated, um, but my understanding is that it, it is a it's an infrastructure issue. Most of it isn't coming from U.S. litter; it's coming from other countries where they just don't have they're not in the same stage of economic development. They don't have proper landfills. They may have open dumps or they don't, or they litter because they don't, there's nothing really there. Um, you know, that was my understanding. Yeah, that's a, that's a big difference depending on geography. So what I'm saying is even in a developed country where everything is provided, people will still throw stuff on the floor. The most recent study I downloaded showed um, children littering, right? So they, they took these children, 42% admitted, admitted to dropping glass on the floor, broke, you know, and breaking it. And of those, um, so uh, of those 58% had been injured by broken glass and several of them have been to the, you know, hospital to get this treated and they're still dropping it, right? I mean, these children who have literally cut their feet open due to the glass that they dropped are still dropping litter. So there's something, you know, within us that no matter how many services you provide there'll always be a significant amount of littering but as you, as you said a lot of the litter we see is coming from countries which which just haven't caught up right it's not like a mystery if you go to denmark or finland or sweden i've lived in sweden right there's no litter there's hardly anything right because people are responsible and and uh, they they have a community spirit and everything's in place and if you look at a life cycle analysis uh, from Denmark on plastic bags, they looked at litter and said, it's so small, we're just going to ignore it because we couldn't find any evidence of plastic bags in Denmark. So there is a, there is a gap depending on, on which country you're in. But the countries who are behind, it's not a mystery how they catch up, right? They just emulate what we've already done. They're just, they're not, and they're not bad people either. They're just behind in terms of economics and they're behind in terms of policy and so forth. So um, it should be quite an easy problem to solve and maybe they need some help to do it. So I think this presents a segue into a, a topic that I wanted to, to learn more about. And it also features a question from Jonathan here, uh, who writes, there seems to be worries about microplastics from washing machines and washing clothes that enter waterways. Can you explain this? Uh, so first, I think it's important to explain what microplastics are and how they differ from the discussion about littering and waste and uh, people dropping things, not taking responsibility for them. And then the down, literally the downstream effects of using certain products. So uh, could, could we tackle microplastics and, and what information do we have and what misinformation needs to be corrected? Chris, maybe we can go to you first. Yeah, this is really a hot topic. So um, there's a few things to say here. One is, 
So there's this misconception that plastics are the only materials that degrade into smaller and smaller pieces. I mean, and it's just mind boggling to me, right? If you take a piece of steel, it, it rusts and forms small pieces of rust, which then form smaller pieces of rust. If you take a rock, it turns into little rocks and then it turns into gravel and then it turns into sand and then it turns into dust. And if you look at uh, pretty much anything solid that we have, it becomes smaller and smaller pieces over time. Um, and so there's nothing unusual about plastics in that regard. Every solid material that I can think of, a leaf becomes small pieces of leaf and so forth, right? And then you can wonder, are those small pieces of leaf toxic? And there actually is evidence to prove that they might be toxic, but nobody questions it when it's a natural product. So the first thing to say is this fear of small things is irrational. Right? There is no reason that we should be especially small of small pieces of plastic. If I take a Ziploc bag, it's made of polyethylene, right? If I chop it in half, is it twice as scary now? If I chop it in half again, is it twice as scary now? Four times as scary, eight times as scary? No, why would something which is non-toxic and you ate your sandwich out of suddenly become a problem when it becomes small? There is no logical reason that it would be. And in fact, there's no evidence that it is a problem. So that's one thing to say, that there's an irrational fear and misunderstanding that plastics are special because they form small particles. Um, second thing to say is that, yes, um, washing clothes does generate a lot of uh, small pieces of plastic. Microplastic just means small pieces of plastic. Um, and clothes is one of the main contributors. Car tires is another one. And, um, and if you look at uh, the oceans, about 8% of the microfibers in the ocean is synthetic plastics, right? So polyester and stuff like that. So it is there and it has been studied. There's just tons and tons of studies on how much is there, where is it, what is it, but there's no cred credible evidence of harm. I've read tons and tons of articles on this. If you go to plasticsparadox.com, there's a whole page devoted to microplastics. And there, is, there are papers that, that purport to show harm, but they're basically fake or such bad science that you won't believe your eyes when you see how badly they did the science. And let me give you some examples, right? Because when one, one scientist accuses another scientist so just to be clear, it's nothing special and there's no credible evidence of harm. But it's, it's very extreme when one scientist accuses other scientists of being unprofessional. But I'm prepared to do that because um, I'm just shocked at how bad the science is, right? So this is how they make microplastics look bad so that they can get their name in the newspaper. They add a million or 10 million times too much microplastic, you know, more than is actually in the ocean. And then they say things like, oh, the animal can't find its food. And like, well, I'm not surprised it can't see where it's going. You put 10 million times too many particles in front of its eyeballs and then report that it's having trouble finding its food. Like what kind of pathetic science is that? And then, and then they pick the wrong kind of plastic. So almost every study done on microplastics is done on a special kind that you can go and buy in a store, right? It's a special kind that scientists love to buy, right? Because it's convenient for them, but it's a kind of plastic that doesn't exist in the world. It's, it doesn't exist anywhere. It's not in the oceans, it's not in the air. It's completely unrealistic. That's like you telling me, hey, Chris, I wanna know if dogs are dangerous. And I say, I've got a great idea. I'll go and buy a hundred cats and study them. And then I'll tell you the results. It's like, no, if you wanna know if dogs are dangerous, you study dogs, you don't study cats. I mean, this is how pathetic the science is. And so there are, there are papers purporting to show um, you know, harm, but they're ridiculously bad science that you can throw right in the, in the trash can. In fact, if it was up to me, these people would be struck off. They would be literally have their PhDs and their professorships taken away from them. They should be, they should demand to have their funding back. Whoever funded these clowns who were doing such terrible research um, just in the name of um, getting them, you know, their name in the newspaper and attracting more funding. I think it's absolutely shocking. And it's not just me saying that. There are other publications saying this is horrendously bad science. Please stop doing it. Mm. One more point to make. There's a, there's a brand new study. I'm sorry, sorry about that, um, Ken. There's a new study and it showed that the media is also misreporting all of this, right? So of all of the recent studies, they, they did a meta study where they look at all the studies on microplastics and all of all the scientific studies, 24% claim that there's some harm, right? But if you look at the media reports, 93% of the media articles that you and I are reading um, claim that there's harm. So of the 24%, I just said, even those ones are many of them are just terrible science and they, they shouldn't even be claiming harm because it's just not true. But anyway, let's, let's accept it. 24% say that there's an established harm, even if the number's too high. And then we're being told, you and I and the teachers at, our, at my kid's school are being told 93% are saying that, it's, that there's harm and it's just not true. So the media take whatever is the most glamorous, they blow it out of all proportion and scare the heck out of everyone because that's the way you sell a headline and that's the way that NGOs get their donations. Um, and that's unfortunate. It's an unfortunate world we live in that you can make up whatever you want and get rich based on a bunch of whoppers. 
Angela, I want to turn for a moment here to the uh, the policy environment, uh, the world where where you and I spend most of our time. Uh, and and Jeff makes a point as a question here. Uh, many of the bans that we see, the prohibitions on the use of plastic, are about single use plastic. And just referring back to the bag bans, uh, the grocery bags that was this, that were discussed earlier. Uh, oftentimes these are not in fact single use. That's not how people behave. So dog owners use them every morning. Uh, people put them in the trash bin. They use them to carry goods to and from the car or whatever it is they're doing throughout the day. Uh, what are the contours of our current policy debate and what sort of legislative proposals are out there related to plastics? Okay, well, on the Hill, there's a major piece of legislation called the Break Free from Plastics Act, which you can tell from the name the underlying agenda is to get rid of plastics. And it sets up, a, again, I mentioned this earlier, it sets up a massive uh, process for managing not just plastics, but all materials from glass, any packaging. Um, it sets up a very bureaucratic government, private public partnership approach to managing plastics, which is would be a nightmare and basically could undermine the industry dramatically. That type of policy is also being looked at at the state and local levels. It's my understanding that a lot of um, industry groups actually, at least in the plastics industry, they, they, they want to do something along the lines of uh, producer responsibility, extended responsibility, but that is something that needs to be pursued in the marketplace. If they want to get in the business of, say, developing advanced recycling um, and taking some of their plastics back, that's fine in a marketplace. But the legislation is much broader. And in fact, I'm not sure that the, the glass industry and some of the other materials realize that it actually could adversely impact them as well and raise costs for consumers um, and certainly make things much less efficient and have environmental adverse impacts over the long haul. Um, so there's a lot going on and it all is underpinned with all this junk science, a lot of it to do with the ocean pollution issue. And I, and I wanted to sort of circle back to what Chris was talking about in that regard, because yes, those plastics break down into smaller parts, but maybe because you could tell us like, I think people would take a little comfort in understanding what they eventually break down into. They don't stay plastics forever, correct? Correct. So they yeah. don't persist forever, correct? No, plastics are made of organic molecules, just like a leaves, just like a DNA that we're made of, just like carbohydrates. They're um, just like enzymes, just like proteins. They're just, plastic just means it's a long molecule, right? So it just breaks down to smaller molecules and then to carbon dioxide and water, just the same as everything else organic. So um, people have this misconception that plastics degrade and become microplastics and they stop degrading. And it's exactly the opposite, right? The smaller something becomes, the faster it degrades. We know that for a fact. What about in the ocean? Yeah, it's still degrade. So uh, there are studies on PET bottles. They're still degrading. Um, they degrade rather rapidly. Um, polystyrene even, which was thought to be extremely inert, was recently found to degrade much more rapidly than thought. Uh, a polyethylene bag left outside, a grocery bag left outside, uh, falls to pieces and disintegrates into you know, basically dust within a year. That has, has actually measured by scientists. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, one of my key areas is plastic degradation. That's what I was on 60 Minutes talking about. And uh, plastics degrade really rapidly. And that's been known. Some of them are unusable without stabilizer, poly, polypropylene. Mm -hmm. are, the sta are the stabilizers, I know environmentalists say the stabilizers are a big problem, or the chemicals that are in the plastics leach out into the ocean and make the animals sick. I mean, what do you, what do you say about that? Yeah, there's studies on that too. So plastic, things that go into plastics, the additives, they're regulated. So people look at, um, there are tons of books and uh, studies on how, well, first of all, they're very tiny amounts, right? So let's say you're going to put stabilizer in a plastic. You'd add like typically, let's say a, a hundred parts per million, right? You can already tell by the name if you're not a chemist, that that's a very small amount. And there are things which are safe, right? Because they're going into Tupperware, they're going into um, you know, Ziploc bags and stuff like that. They're going into toys that go in your mouth. They're all things that have been tested. They know what the molecule is. They know how much is there. They know how much comes out if you were to get into touch with it, into contact with it. And sometimes it's a natural product, even like vitamin E is used as a stabilizer. So yeah, there's no real, there's no real problem there. Um, but you did mention chemicals. And so this is another, um, another trick, I would say that um, people have done to make plastics look worse, right? So this is what they do. They take microplastics, they soak them in poison, and then they put them in a fish tank and say, look, the fish got sick. 
right? And then they say, look, the plastics are releasing poison. I'm like, of course they're releasing poison. You just soaked them in poison, right? To make the plastics look bad. You could have dipped your sock in the, in the poison or you could have just poured the poison on top of the fish and they would have got sick, right? The plastic is not even a part of the equation, but this is how, these are the lengths that people will go to to make plastics look bad. Um, so there's a misconception that plastics are releasing toxins and that's not really the case. What happens when you put plastic in, this, in the ocean, and this is proven, the plastic absorbs the toxins which are already in the water, right? So the fish are in toxic water and the plastic absorbs the toxin and holds it inside. Even if the fish eats the plastic, it goes right through and the toxin stays in the plastic. That's all proven. The net effect of that plastic, I'm not suggesting we should throw plastic in the ocean to protect the fish, but the net effect of the plastic in the ocean is to absorb the toxins and pro protect the wildlife. And any toxin released, it's just the toxin that was already in the water with the fish in the first place. So the whole thinking around this is completely bizarre and, uh, and incorrect and misleading. Early in our conversation, there was a mention of uh, issue campaigners and, and uh, large nonprofits and, and different people that are advocating for some of these restrictions on the use or manufacture of, of plastics. Uh, is there... Uh, among that uh, energy and debate, uh, are there good plastics and bad plastics? For example, uh, you know, things that go into our plastic water bottles, are they condemned? Whereas things in the hospital that make uh, nasal cannula available or things that make a, a airbag in our automobile work, are those considered good plastics or is it just comprehensively, uh, we don't like things that have been manufactured and therefore we will condemn them all. Can I, can I jump in on this one? Please. Um, and the hospital stuff, it, it's interesting. Um, to some people, anything that's single use is a bad plastic, um, more so than other plastics. But I would argue that single use plastics have immeasurable benefits. And one of the things I highlighted in one of the papers I did was uh, the environmentalist attack on something called blue wrap which is used in hospitals to keep trays of sterile equipment um, stored. So after a procedure, you, you, know, you sterilize and they're wrapped in blue wrap and they stay sterile. The alternative is to have tins or other things. And all the research shows that the, the risk of getting a disease or having a contamination on those reusable containers is much higher. And hospital acquired infections is a huge problem. So anything we can do to sort of minimize that, there's a lot of different plastics that are used in the hospital and they're used once because they save lives and the impacts are huge. So, you know, the benefits are tremendous, but some of these groups, they still wanna get rid of it. There's a group called Healthcare Without Harm and they have been working for decades to try to attack plastic use in hospitals from blood bags to blue wrap to, you know, a number of items. It's, there's no easy way to replace these things. In fact, we should be looking at more single-use plastics in hospitals um, because the infection rate is very, very high. And you know, we've just suffered a COVID uh, crisis and when hospitals are busy, infection rates are, are even worse. And so we need to be thinking strategically, not at this sort of unscientific anti-plastic, anti-single-use plastic mentality because it's a very dangerous concept. Before I uh, invite you to both help me wrap up, uh, I want to see if I can squeeze one more big topic in here for just a, a moment or two. We talked about the um, quality of science, but uh, Chris, you, you write and cover extensively the notion of corruption. Could you give us a couple uh, thoughts on that topic and why it fits in with uh, investigation of plastic well, I would say that any sensible adult knows that you have to look at people's motives, right? When you're listening to a source of information, you have to wonder, what does this person want from me? What are they selling me, right? So you can go to um, a website of some of these popular NGOs, and you can see claims that plastics last hundreds of years, but there's no evidence next to the claim. You can see pictures of turtles, but there's no evidence of harm to turtles. You can see pictures of whales and panda and polar bears. In fact, uh, World Wildlife Fund had to apologize because they made up this, uh, the National Geographic, I think, had to, it was, sorry, the National Geographic had to apologize for that polar bear picture because it turned out to have nothing to do with global warming, but it made a great picture. So whenever you look at um, 
people who are trying to tell you something question their motives, right? And that's one of the reasons I made my book for free. Although I put in a thousand hours of my own unpaid time to create the book and the website, I wanted to make it available for free so that you know that I'm giving you my advice as a professional scientist and I'm not making a penny from it. In fact, I'm losing money. So um, that is, um, you know, my, that, that's, that's what I would say about that. These people have got hundreds of millions of dollars. And I often wonder, I go to Wikipedia and I see um, that Greenpeace has $400 million, for example. And I wonder why are they not putting a net across the Ganges, right? And stopping all the plastic. I, I've never seen a single article. I'm 54, right? I've never seen a single article where Greenpeace went out and spent $100 million of the money that they took to actually do something for the environment. All I ever see them do is publish reports usually by someone who has, I, they don't even have a plastics expert as far as I can find, but they publish these reports condemning things while just sticking the money in their bank as far as I can tell. So maybe I'm wrong, but that's how it looks to me. And, um, and here are some examples, right? There's been a lot of defections recently. Here's a book by Patrick Moore, who was a, one of the presidents of Greenpeace, right? Telling you that they're a bunch of con artists. That's what he says, right? Here's his other book telling you that they're just making this stuff up. That's their business model, according to him, their business model is to make up stuff in a place you can never check it, like a patch of, like an island of plastic in the ocean that doesn't actually exist, right? And then they put a picture of a turtle or a whale and they make you empty your pockets, right? So, um, and here's, here's another one, False Alarm by Bjorn Lomberg. There's another guy. And it's Michael Schellenberger, who I think you guys have met. He's another one. So these people were passionate environmentalists who defected and left and exposed their former places of work as being con artists. Um, and so there's a lot of money going, a lot of money changing hands here. And whenever that happens, you can be sure, you know, that there'll be somebody taking advantage of it. So uh, I've just asked people to be, you know, just use common sense and question, where is the money flowing? And can I trust these people? And where's the evidence? Most importantly, where is the evidence? Go and look on these people's websites and see that they, they don't have any. They're all pointing to each other's websites, but there's no science. It's just fiction. I, I need to point out, we've had... Uh easily uh, a whole number of multiples of people trying to get their questions in and join the conversation here. Uh, for all of those people who are participating online or who see the program after we finish recording, I encourage you to visit Chris's website. That's plasticparadox.com. Uh, 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 you can track down Angela and her work at our own website, cei.org. Um, if I could ask you, invite you both just to give me uh, one big idea. What, what is one idea that you want to leave with our audience before I handle a couple of administrative details as we log off? Angela, uh, perhaps you first and then followed by Chris. Uh, what's your one big idea on plastics today? My one, my one big idea is that people need to start recognizing the benefits that we might lose if we start banning and regulating these things away. And actually the the dangers that that would pose to the environment and to our quality of life. That's it. And, and Chris, uh, what takeaway do you have for our audience? I would say you can be against plastics or you can be for the environment, but you can't be both. So choose. Are you having a lot of fun demonizing plastics or making a lot of money doing it? I understand. Keep doing it but you'll be damaging the environment. So if you can sleep sound in your bed at night, knowing that you're harming the environment by demonizing plastics, I mean, literally 100% proven to increase fossil fuel, increase CO2, increase pollution, increase waste, and so on. If, if you feel good about that, keep doing it. But if you genuinely want to protect the planet for a better future and for our children, please look at the evidence because there's no virtue in being against something when you haven't been bothered to check the facts. Please go and look at, um, go and look at the website, download the free book, and check everything I said. It's all I cite everything, so you can check every word and see that it's true. And thousands of people have done that. Very good. We've got uh, exhortations toward an understanding of trade-offs and to really look at the evidence. Examine things for yourself. Think for yourself. Uh, I really appreciate both of you joining me today. I do have a couple notes for our audience. Uh, in two weeks, CEI will be back with another online forum. So check your inboxes for an invitation to join us on Tuesday the 30th for a discussion on long-term reforms necessary to resolve the supply chain problems that continue to ripple through our lives. The program will feature something of a CEI all-star lineup with Ian Murray, Sean Higgins, Marlo Lewis, and Ryan Young. And then next month, I'll be back with another book forum. On December 9th, I look forward to talking to my friend Tony Woodleaf, who has just published iCitizen, a blueprint for reclaiming American self-governance. 
Chris, Angela, thank you both for being with us and for the resources you've made available. I appreciate all your uh, good cheer and good information. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us and please give us feedback on this and other CEI programs 